these are some notes for you for studying for the midterm on week two. Is cognition just a form of computation? This is about the work of Zen and Polition, who suggest that cognition is a form of computation, and of course is based on the uh, underlying work of Turing on computation itself, and what is computation. And my own paper is a critique of Polition. To remind you that this is all about explanation, we're trying to explain cognition. And the candidate here is computation. Cognition is computation. Uh, we've already learned that introspection isn't going to tell you how the mind works. It doesn't tell you, also doesn't tell you what uh, computation your mind is doing if, if the mind is in fact just doing, if the brain is just doing computation. Um, Pilition, Pilition's case began as a case against mental imagery as an explanation of cognition. I mean, one of the ways that uh, that his predecessors try to explain how the brain does was it what it does is, for example, it says that they would say things like, um, in order to uh, recognize, in order to remember something, I have to get an image in my head, and then the image reminds me. Well, the trouble with that is that the image is reminding a little man in your head, whereas the the homunculus that's looking at the image. Whereas uh, what we really need to know is how the homunculus, from looking at the image finds whatever it is that it's looking for. So imagery in and of itself for pollution doesn't explain anything. But we're going to come back to that because it turns out that, first of all, it's undeniable that we do have imagery in our heads. And number two, it's probably deniable that uh, imagery doesn't explain anything. It doesn't explain anything if you have a homuncular theory that sort of cons considers the fact that an image comes up in your head to be taken for granted. Uh, but if you're interested in how the image is found and what can be done with the image to find something else out, then you are interested in an explanation and possibly images will turn out to be useful. But according to, um, to Polition, we have to get rid of images. We have to cash them in to something else that explains what the images are. Um, well, actually, he considers the images to be just... Um, epiphenomena that don't particularly play any role at all, but uh, what it has to do is explain what your mind is doing when you're looking at an image to finally give you the answer that you're looking for. If you're, For example, the example I gave you in class was uh, try to remember your third grade school teacher's name. One of the ways that people say they um, remember it is that they think of her image or his image and then they um, read the name off the image. And what Polition says is, what is that? I mean, <laughs> I asked you the name, and you tell me a little man in your head somehow conjures up an image, and then from conjuring up the image figures out the name. Well, I wanted to know how your brain did that. You haven't told me anything. You've just told me what it feels like to introspect when you're trying to find your teacher's name. I want to know the process. And his hypothesis, Polition's uh, hypothesis, was that it was computation. Actually, originally, he didn't say computation. He said propositions. He, uh, he, he considered the propositional theory of mind to be the alternative to the imagist theory of mind. But as, we'll dis, uh, as we've found out in this course, the imagery theory of mind would simply be an analog theory of mind if you got rid of the homunculus, and the propositional theory would just be a computational theory. The homunculus, of course, that's the, if you look at the back of that picture, you'll see the little man looking at the image. That doesn't work. We're trying to we're trying to figure out what's going on in the little man's head, and you can't put another little man in there, so that's the infinite regress of a homunculus, and it has some, that infinite regress has some similarity to the infinite regress that will come up in the symbol grounding problem, but it's not the same infinite regress. So what Polition wants to do is discharge the homunculus, replace all of that stuff you see over there with uh, a mechanism, something that actually takes whatever it is that the eye is seeing and doesn't repeat it for a little the little eye of a little person inside the head, but actually does the work that um, that's going on in the head to generate our capacities. And it's our capacities that we're interested in. It's everything that we can do. Um, we'll get back to the issue of robots later, but clearly robots have a lot of our capacities. If you ever build a robot that you can't tell apart from a person, um, in any, everything that it can do, 
then whatever the mechanism is inside the robot, that'll be the explanation, at least one explanation of cognition. I'll tell you one thing it won't be, and that Polition is right about it. won't be a little man in his head looking at images. The analog-digital distinction, which is similar to the dynamic computational distinction, is mainly about continuous physical processes like um, balls falling, billiard balls hitting one another, planets rotating around um, the sun. Those are continuous physical processes, and they obey the laws of physics, laws of motion, gravitation, electromagnetism, etc., etc. That's all analog. Digital is discrete processes. The, the uh, t two um, timepieces that you see over there, they're not saying the same time. Actually, the upper one says 1010 and the lower one says 1209. But if the lower one also said 1010, the digital one, then they'd be telling you the same thing, but one of them does it by a continuous uh, rotation uh, around the entire circle. The lower one does it discreetly by changing the, uh, the faces on that crystal display. And it's discreet. It's got uh, the, the, uh, the display, a particular dis display section is either on or off. And uh, the entire display, 1010 or 1209, as you see over there, is the name of the time. Now, strictly speaking, a watch uh, is kind of both digital and analog because when it when it moves around, the, the hand is moving around, an analog hand is moving around continuously, but it's coming to certain points which we call one, two, three o'clock, or quarter to three, etc. That's digital. A better example of that would be a sundial uh, without any names. If you had a sundial, that's simply the sun, as the sun um, as the Earth rotates and the uh, Sun seems to go around the Earth, um, there'll be times when, when the uh, shadow of the sundial is long and when it's short. And if you simply, if you didn't give the time a name, but you simply went by whether it's long or short, sort of a, a more or less, more or less answer rather than a digital answer, um, you would be using a sundial in an analog way. Um, the, the example that I used to give in class of something strictly analog is if I hold my arms apart at a certain distance and you simply imitate me and hold it up apart at the same distance, that's as analog as you can get. You're simply matching one quantity to another. If it's a sundial, you're using it in an analog way. If you just say, well, when it's short, we'll go out and play. When it's long, we'll go home to sleep or something like that. Even that, by the way, is a digital distinction that should, should remind you of. I forget who it, who it is that is it... Um, Adriana, that keeps on bringing up the fact that swimming is not just analog. Um, dynamic symbolic is much the same distinction. The, the, a, a dynamic system, a dynamical system, is like the billiard uh, table over there, which has the laws of motion. When something sets the cue stick going, and let's say it's not a person, because that brings in the mind-body problem, but let's say the cue stick is just activated by a landslide and it, and then the stick is hit and the hit a stick hits a ball and the ball hits another ball etc those are all the laws of motion and that's a dynamical system like the sundial right and anything in your brain that's happening that's like that that's just a physical physical process described by the laws of motion or chemistry or whatever is a dynamical process whereas a symbolic process is the, the one that you see on the lower right the score of the game is not only shown by a digital um, board uh, giving the score, but also you have uh, home and guest and fouls and player. Those are all symbolic descriptions. But this is just a static set of symbols, where a whereas a computer program is a dynamic set of symbols. Dynamic in the sense that the computer program, which is computational, is implemented on a computer, and that's a dynamical system that's making the computations actually happen according to the rules of the computation. Um, another sort of a dichotomy that goes along with this is the dichotomy between simulation and reality. Actually, the billiard uh, table on the left is not a real billiard table. It's a simulated billiard table. And uh, to the lower right, you see people in a, sim in a virtual reality. They're, they think they're seeing objects and moving objects and walk, walking around in a, or, or I forget what they're doing over here. Maybe they're cycling or, or they're uh, flying in an area which doesn't exist. It's simply equipment that's fooling their senses, the equipment is driven by a computational 
a computer program, a computational algorithm, and it's fooling their senses into thinking that they're getting real input from the outside world. Uh, these dichotomies are not identical, analog, digital, um, uh, dynamic, um, symbolic or dynamic computational, and simulation versus reality. And by the way, the reality should be first. It should be reality simulation in order to match dynamic reality and uh, analog are on one side and digital computational symbolic and simulation are on the other side. Uh, sim but as I say, simulation gets more complicated. Don't worry about it for this course, but when you're, when you're doing virtual reality, it's, you're using a computer simulation, but you're feeding it to analog senses, to your eyes and your ears. And so uh, it's a kind of a funny hybrid system when you have virtual reality input to a real brain with real senses. Um, this is another aspect of the analog digital distinction. You have a continuous signal, that wave. If you dis break it into little discrete parts, then you've, then you've got something uh, that's ready for computation, if you like, because uh, uh, the input to a, to a computation would just be numbers or, or bits. It doesn't even have to be numbers. It just has to be binary bits broken up into little pieces. The smallest pieces, I guess, would be binary. Um, same dichotomy, this time it's physical, which is the same as formal, uh, pardon me, physical is the same as dynamic, analog, reality, etc. And formal is what's symbolic and digital. Um, mathematics is formal, language is formal, computer programs are formal, but when you implement a computer program in a computer, it becomes dynamic. It's the dynamic implementation of a computation. Hardware, software, it's the same distinction. Hardware, um, not, uh, hardware is dynamic, it's, it's physical, and software is the computer program. And when you run the software on the hardware, then you've got a dynamical system that is executing a computer program. So you can describe it dynamically, or you can describe it computationally. You can say what computation it's performing. And Polition's theory would be that our brains are really performing a computation, so the right description for what they're doing is not dynamic, not analog, but digital and computational. Find the algorithm that your brain is executing and you've explained how it's doing what it's doing. Uh, except he doesn't make just the hardware-software distinction, he makes a sort of a more sophisticated distinction, which is the distinction between the functional, it's the level, he's, he's interested in the level of the functional architecture of the virtual machine. Now, when you're using a Mac or a, or a PC, this is regular digital hardware, configure it somewhat differently. Their architectures are somewhat different. A PC has, does what a PC does and a Mac does what a P, Mac does. But you can get a Mac to imitate a PC and you can get a PC to imitate a Mac. And that's Polition's point that the relevant thing for cognition is the level of the virtual machine and not the very bottom level of uh, zero one bits. The trouble with this idea that uh, your uh, cognition begins where the, at the level of the virtual machine and everything below the level of the virtual machine that, that's being um, simulated by the computer, that everything below that is, um, is something else than cognition. The trouble with that is that it's homuncular. Because the whole distinction between a, a, a virtual machine, if, I'm, if, I'm, if I sit down at a computer and I want to know, is this really a Mac or is it a PC imitating a Mac? The reason that dif difference makes a difference is because I'm the user, right? And I'm using the system and I want to know what, uh, what is the, uh, what is the uh, shape of the system, if you like, at the level that I'm using it. But it doesn't make sense to say that about cognition. It becomes like homunculus when you're saying uh, cognition starts in the brain at the level of the virtual machine. That makes it seem like there's a homunculus in the brain that's using the virtual machine. So there's something fishy about this virtual machine level, but don't break your heads about it because it's not fundamental to the course. It's just one of the things that comes out of the long paper of Polition. I'm going to have to speed this up because it's, um, I'm spending too much time on each slide. Codes and chunking was about uh, how you can reorganize information by um, building it into bigger and bigger chunks. And probably the best example you can keep in your head now is uh, 
words. I mean, you, you can name fruits, apple, orange, um, raisins, they're not fruit, grapes, uh, and then you can um, go to a higher level and you can talk about fruits, and then you can go to a f higher level and you can go to food, and you can go to a still higher level and you can talk about things if that helps. And that means that every time you refer, for example, at the medium level to a fruit, that covers all of the things that, that are at the lower level, raisins, apples, bananas, etc. That's very useful in um, encoding the world, if you like. That's why dictionary definitions are so useful. That's why definitions are so useful in mathematics. One of the things that they say in mathematics is that the, the test of whether you've proven a theorem that was worth proving is that it generates a definition because the thing that, that the new property that the new property that you've proved probably allows you to name a new object, namely those things that have that property. I gave you an example of a bad um, new name, and that's things that are bigger than a bread box. That's not particularly useful in the world. But if you did have uh, something useful in the world for things that were bread, bigger than a bread box, then you have a word for it—a supra 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 box or something for anything that's bigger than a bread box. Those are examples of chunking, and they, they'll come back later on this course, on in this course as being important. Another form of chunking, and they came up in that objection about whether swimming is digital or analog, and it certainly applies to things like piano playing and skilled performances, that there's a kind of a motor chunking too, but it's not a symbolic chunking. It's just taking movements and putting them into, make, putting them into bigger sequences and then making the bigger sequence the unit instead of the, the sub uh, subsequence. For, so, for example, with the pianist, it's no longer which finger do I move on which key, but you think in terms of scales and arpeggios and and uh, and even larger sequences that you that are combined, and um, your brain encodes the sequence the the uh, entire action series in terms of the bigger chunks, and lets the smaller parts of the chunks take care of themselves the same way that uh, that um, they take care of themselves when you're talking about things and not distinguishing whether they're living things or non-living things or fruit or what have you, just letting things stand for all of the stuff underneath. Propositions, as I said, uh, Collision originally spoke about propositions, linguistic uh, descriptions if you like, and then he switched to computation and with that of course he, he got himself a very powerful tool, the, the, the power of computation, which is enormous. Um, but he also inherited a problem, and that's the symbol grounding problem, because in the case of thoughts, uh, unlike in computation, which is simply manipulation of symbols according to rules uh, that are based on their shape, and their shape has nothing to do with what they mean, in the case of thinking, presumably, it does have something. What, what the symbols mean does have an influence on what it is that we do with them. So, whereas um, computation is... Um, meaningful but doesn't use meaning as can't use meaning as the basis for uh, what it does thinking does so that should already make you wonder whether thinking could be just computation the cat is on the mat of course is uh, you have to know what a cat is you have to know what a mat is and you know what you have to know what being on a being on something is and then you can say the cat is on the mat or the mat is on the cat or what have you clearly the meaning plays a role in that it's not just syntax whereas in the case of 2 plus 2 is 4 all you have to do, there is a meaning there too, but in mathematics you don't use the meaning. All you do is use the formal rules, and arithmetic tells you what to do when you have symbols in the form of the, that 2 plus 2 equals 4. Whether that uh, arithmetic will tell you how to figure out whether that's true or not. And um, the, the, the way you figure it out, the algorithm, has nothing to do with the meaning of. Two. You don't have to know the meaning of 2 and of 2 and of equals and of 4. You just have to know how to manipulate the symbols. So computation is rule-based and shape-based. The rules operate on the shape. And it's also implementation independent. I said that a computation has to be physically implemented. So every computation is performed by a dynamical system. But the dynamics are irre irrelevant. What's, well, the only thing that's relevant is what computation it's performing. So it's, the computation is rules, and the rules are based on manipulating shapes, and the shapes are, uh, are unrelated to whatever it is that they might mean. The implementation, the physical implementation, is necessary, but it isn't, uh, but it isn't relevant to the computation. It's the computation that's relevant. And, the, and the, perhaps the most important thing is that 
computations that are worth doing are in, in, have a meaning. They're semantically interpretable. Two and two plus two equals four is interpretable as meaning that two plus two is equals equals four. And the cat is on the mat is also interpretable in, interpretable as being the cat is on the mat. But the difference is that two plus two is four in arithmetic doesn't make use of the meaning of two and two and four. It just makes use of the syntax. Whereas the cat is on the mat has to make use of meaning. It's not just syntax. It's not just symbol manipulation. Uh, syntax, as I say, is, is the shape. And you'll see with the cat is on the mat, you, you also know the meaning. In the case of the Chinese string there, you don't know what the syntax is. You, have, you don't know what the symbols mean. So all you see is squiggle, squiggle, squaggle, squaggle. But to a Chinese person, that means something too. Um, there was Polition's criterion of cognitive impenetrability. What he said was that there is the way that you figure out whether you're at the right level for cognitive explanation, which is the level of the virtual architect, the, the uh, pardon me, the functional architecture of the virtual machine that is doing the cognition. The way you can figure out that you're at the right level is that stuff at that level and above is cognitively impenetrable. Pardon me, is cog above. <laughs> At that level and above, it's cognitively penetrable. That means you can change the way you, you, uh, you uh, see it and understand it by what somebody tells you, whereas below that level, you can't change it. And so, for example, for the mueller liar illusion, it's in vain that somebody explains to you that the lines are actually the same length, and they're only made to appear as if they're um, shorter in the lower case because the arrows are going inwards rather than outwards. No matter what somebody tells you, you still keep seeing the upper line as being longer. So that's cognitively impenetrable. And that means for Polition that that's not cognition. It's below the level of the functional architecture of the virtual machine that is you. And according to me, that's homuncular to say that. Uh, the, the virtual machine that I use when I'm using a, a, a computer, say a Mac that's imitating a PC, I as a user understand what, what's meant by the virtual machine. The virtual machine is a Mac. The actual machine is, let's say, a PC. And the, and the level at which I'm using it is the Mac. I'm not using it at the level of zeros and ones, which are even below the level of the PC. That's fine for computers, but when it comes to my own cognition, I, I'm not a user. I am the cognizer. So what does it mean to say that uh, there's a virtual machine? Who's using the virtual machine? The, according to the Church, Church Turing thesis, not only does computation capture what it is that mathematicians and physicists mean by computing something. Every single instance of co computing has been captured by, um, by um, Turing's Turing machine and Church's the post machine and Church's recursive functions or whatever they were. Um, the Church Turing thesis goes beyond that. It says not only does that capture everything that a mathematician means by computation, and those are symbol manipulations, but it can also simulate computationally everything that's dynamic. So not only is it now, it's, uh, there's two ends of this. Not only does a computation have to be implemented as a dynamical system, not only do you need to have hardware on which to run, to run software, but it's also true that using software, you can, you can simulate any physical system. For example, I told you that a dynamical system is the planetary system. Uh, you can simulate the planetary system computationally, digitally. You can write a computer program that you can run that will capture the properties symbolically, not really, but symbolically, of a of planetary system. It, there won't be um, things actually moving around uh, in real space, but inside the simulation there will be um, quantities that correspond to those and that change uh, sequentially the same way that, the, di discreetly rather than continuously, but sequentially the same way that planets do. Uh, moreover, it's even more powerful than that. Not only can, can computation simulate just about, it, just about every physical process, uh, there's some things that are, that, are, that are too big to be simulated or too uh, dense to be simulated by computation, but, um, or, or at least can be simulated by computation, but not, not... I shouldn't say that, actually. Maybe, to, uh, maybe the right way to state the Church-Turing thesis is that to a close enough approximation you can simulate anything computationally, but of course, you can always come closer. So that's not so you can't. You don't actually hit reality that way. If you look at the the discrete curve below there, it can I can make the the um, 
discrete unit smaller and smaller so it becomes closer and closer to a smooth curve, but it's never really a smooth curve. That's the church Turing thesis. And then the more complicated thing is that you can use simulation to produce virtual reality, not reality itself, but virtual reality that will then fool your senses, which are analog. But that's another little tidbit. The Turing machine, as I said, uh, Turing formalized computation in his way with, a, with a, 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 an infinite tape of uh, zeros and ones coming over a machine head that's reading it, and the machine is in a certain state, and the state says that um, that the state, it doesn't say anything, it's, it's the, the dynamics make the machine, force the machine that when it uh, to behave so that when it reaches a zero, when it's in the present state, when it reaches a zero, what it does is it moves the state one, uh, it moves the tape one one um, bit over and it writes a one and it stops. That's, for example, one state that it could be in. It could be in another state. You could say, move it the one bit over, write a one, then move it again and read what you see. So it can go on like that. So depending on the current that state of the system, the dynamical system, and that state is in a computer is dictated by its, by its program, a computer is simply doing these things. It's just reading zeros and ones and writing zeros and ones according to its own state, and its own state is operating based on rules that look at the shape, whether it's a zero or a one. Not what it means, but simply the shape. That's the Turing machine, and that turns out to be the same as recursive functions, as post machines, and as all of the other attempts to formalize what computation is. So since all of the attempts to formalize it turned out to be the same thing, turned out to be equivalent, uh, what everybody believes now is that that really captured computation, and the computation is just that, just symbol manipulation against, according to these rules. The Turing test, which is not the same as the Church Turing thesis, uh, asks um, a, you have to build a model that's capable of doing everything that a human being can do, and in Turing's original version, what it required was that um, it should be able to uh, do exchange email with you like a pen pal for a, for a lifetime without being distinguishable from a real person. If it does that, it's passed the Turing test. Of course, there are other variants of the Turing test which involve robots. In this particular version, the robot isn't being tested as a robot. It's just being tested as a pen pal. What is cognition? Well, according to Polition, um, cognition, is, first of all, we have to, cognition is as cognition does. We have to explain how um, how um, people can do what they can do. They do it by means of cognition, and according to Polition, computation is cognition. The trouble with that, of course, is it's going to raise the problem of the symbol, symbol grounding, and that's the problem of how you get to meaning, to semantics from syntax. Syntax is just squiggles and squaggles uh, uh, manipulated according to rules based on their shapes. How do we get from that to the meanings of symbols? Uh, the next uh, talk will be about Searle's Chinese room argument, which tries to show that co uh, cognition isn't just computation. <laughs>